Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks, Mark. Uh, if you're in the back, feel free to find your way inside. Um, yeah, let me start. I just want to get as close to Mike as I can, possibly. Okay, cool. Um, well, good morning, everyone. If I haven't met you before, my name is Nick. This is my wife, Hannah. We just wanted to welcome you to church. Grateful to be here. Grateful to worship our Father together. Uh, as you know, we are a community that's passionate about extending loving community to our neighbors who need it with the grace and truth of Christ. And so we hope that you feel the warmth of this community, the love that's within this community. It's all centered around Jesus. Uh, we do want to go through a few announcements. So if you have your bulletins out, feel free to take those out and open them up. And Hannah's going to kick us off. All right. Our first announcement is for all the ladies. We are going to be kicking off our women's Bible study. So we have three of them that will be offered this upcoming semester. We have the Wednesday evening one, the Thursday morning one, and the Thursday evening one. So if you are interested at all, have any questions, want to sign up today, please head to the patio after church. And there's a beautiful table set up out there. And you can uh, sign up or ask any questions you may have about it. Good stuff. All right. Uh, at the back of your bulletins, we've got our barbecue bash, the 60th Beach Bible Anniversary Barbecue Bash. And uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, but I didn't mention like what you guys are going to be cooking if you wanted to enter in. Uh, it's going to be pulled pork, which sounds really good, smoked pulled pork. If you're interested in participating in the barbecue competition, you're going to contact Mike. And uh, Mike's right here, if you didn't know. He's going to be the guy in the front, Pastor. Um, and so contact him if you do have any questions, if you want to enter into that competition, or if you just want to come and participate and be a part of, of the party that's happening here. Uh, it's going to be on the uh, 23rd of September, starting at 5 p.m. Uh, here at Beach Bible. And so uh, there's also some information. If you're coming, uh, if your last name is between A and M, please bring a side dish. And if your last name is between N and Z, bring a dessert for uh, everyone to share. All right, our next one is Awana. So Awana starts September 13th. So if you have any kids, neighbors, friends with kids that are interested in doing Awana, please invite them, please sign up. Awana is a really cool outreach event. I grew up doing Awana, loved bringing my neighbors to Awana. So be thinking if you're already signed up of some other kids that you can invite. Um, another announcement with that, if anyone is interested in volunteering, we always need volunteers with Awana, so please reach out to Ann Minch, and she will get you connected. That's right, and then Truck or Treat is coming up uh, October 28th, Saturday, so two big needs that we have for Truck or Treat are one, candy, lots and lots and lots of candy, so if you want to purchase candy at the store, I'm sure they're already selling it at Albertsons across the street. Uh, feel free to get some and drop it off here at church. We would greatly appreciate that. Also, trunks. If you want to participate in decorating your trunk, uh, we've had some pretty incredible themes in the past. If you'd like to be a part of that, go ahead and contact Kristen Louvier, and she'll be able to help you with that. And our last announcement is the parenting class. So a lot of people joined last week. If you didn't this last week, come today. It's a really incredible opportunity to gather as parents, whether you're married, a single parent. It's really cool to just sit around a table, talk. We have great teachers that are teaching us, filling us with wisdom on how to parent our children. So please feel free and join us. 1030 sharp, right? Where's Dan? 1030 sharp in the Cornerstone building, okay? Not 1031, not 1032, 1030. All right, we're going to start, all right? Sounds good. Let's go ahead and pray uh, before we dive into the rest of our service. Please bow your heads with me and pray. Father God, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as one body to worship you, Lord. I thank you for this church family and for each and every person who is a part of it, for the hands that uh, are constantly working on things behind the scenes for different events that we have coming up, for uh, our Sunday school teachers who are preparing the lessons throughout the week, for Mike as he's preparing for his sermon throughout the week. Um, Lord, we just uh, are grateful for how you use each and every person here. And Father, we want you to be the focus this morning, and so I know we can easily get distracted with different things happening in our lives, whether it's work or family or friendships or other things that might add some stress to our lives, God. We want to just lay that at your feet this morning. We want to uh, praise you for the God that you are, um, the God who is sovereign over all circumstances, 
And so uh, that's the God that we're praising this morning, God. Uh, we love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. If you guys are able at this time, would you stand as we as we head into worship this morning? Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. And they were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. And those giants are dead now. We sing, this is our God. And this is our God. This is who we are. Sing the 
song of ages to the Lamb. Sing your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name is standing. seated at this time. Well, good morning, everyone. We have the privilege again of gathering around the Lord's table to uh, celebrate communion. And what I'd like to do today, you know, we usually have a few words to sort of focus our hearts and our minds on Christ and what he's done for us. So today I'd like to talk about uh, the love of Christ that brought him to the cross, that brings us to this table. And I'd like to read uh, from Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 6 through 11. It says, For why were we yet helpless at the right time? Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by him and his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. Who did God love enough to die for? It was the helpless, the ungodly, the sinner his enemy. Who's that? Who is that? That that was us, right? That was us. 
you know, he didn't just love the best of us. He didn't die for the most righteous of us or the most beautiful or the smartest or the kindest. But he died and he came and he loved for all of us, all of us. Um, you know, I don't really think I uh, understand the, this passage really fully. Um, and I'm not trying to make this about me. Maybe you feel the same way or think the same way. But I don't really think that I really have a grasp on the depth of my uh, depravity. You know, the level of my sinfulness. You know, I, I acknowledge I'm a sinner, but I sugarcoat it. I sugarcoat it. You know, I look around and I say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not so bad as compared to other people, as if that's the standard. Um, but that's not the standard. You know, there's one standard, and that's the standard of the holy and righteous God. And so, you know, in the eyes of God, I don't really think that I really grasp the depth of my depravity. And on the other hand, also, I can never comprehend the perfection of his holiness. And he's pure and perfect. Right, you know, sin can't even be in his presence. And I don't understand the perfection of his righteousness. You know, he's the righteous God who cannot bear any sin to, be, to go unpunished. And if I really understood the depth of my sin and the perfection of God's holiness and righteousness and the love that it took to gap that to save me, to save you, I, that is overwhelming. That it would just crush me, honestly, if I really understood the love that Christ had for us to bring him to the cross to save us, the helpless, the sinner, the ungodly, the enemy of God. And what is the extent of his love for us? You know, while we're yet sinners, Christ, what, died for us. He gave it all. I mean, he gave his life. What more could he give to show his love for us? And that's the love that reconciles us to Christ. That's the love that bring, brought him to the cross. That's the love that brings us here to this table this morning. And for those of you who haven't been reconciled to Christ, you haven't taken that step to become reconciled, uh, maybe you've been in the church and sit here week after week and listen to God's truth be preached, and you still haven't taken that step, I got to ask you this question. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? If I knew that somebody loved me enough, loved me regardless, to die for me, that's the person I want to follow. Yeah? So should you. So... With that in mind, Lord, thank you. We're going to have the men pass the elements. Everybody hang on to them. We'll take it all together at the end, okay? Creator. 
Reading from Luke now. This is in the upper room. And when he, Jesus, had given some bread, or taken some bread, rather, and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. And it goes on, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Let's take it together. Will you pray with me? And then we can pass the cups uh, to the center. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your indescribable love for us, for mankind. Lord, you deserve all the glory. Um, and as uh, we agree with uh, what Paul wrote in Romans 11, that through you, or from you, and through you, and to you, are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you guys are able for this last song here before the message, would you stand as we worship our King? I'm no longer 
child of God. One more time, church. can be seated at this time. All right, kid. Ooh, that's loud. Have fun. There's usually a little bumper thing going on there, but uh, I'll pretend like it happened and uh, we'll, we'll keep moving forward. So, uh, well, welcome back. My name is Pastor Mike Kalani. for those who don't know me, um, and it's my privilege to be taking us through a series uh, that I'm calling Who Am I? Um, and the series is not so much addressing uh, our identity in Christ, but uh, addressing how the church is should respond to this phenomenon we see in our world of people out there looking for the answers of uh, who they are, uh, where they belong, what makes their life uh, meaningful or valuable. Um, and the reality is that people are searching for identity. Um, and it's supposed to, those questions, like I said last week, are good questions. They're questions that God puts on your heart uh, so that you will, if, if things go well, you will find your home back in God's family. That's like he gives you those questions so you'll seek him out, you'll search him for him, and you'll find him. Challenges in our world is that some people, uh, the, those um, those questions have been leading, people have been finding answers that aren't the answer, but they're kind of counterfeits that have been all over the place, leading into a lot of like crazy places, uh, which is a challenge for the church because it's, we don't know what to do with it. Um, now, I should say this, this, the idea of someone looking for something and not finding where they're supposed to be and still searching and out there. Uh, or maybe finding it in the wrong spot, the Bible has a term for that. And that term is lost. Uh, and it makes sense. If someone's supposed to be home, and they're not, and they're out there, and they don't know where they are, they think they're home, but they're not home, uh, that's the same term that we would use for them even in just a regular uh, scenario. And so, but the, the interesting thing is, that obviously that word means a lot in the Christian uh, landscape and Christian, what you would call language or parlance, because Jesus taught some very famous parables about lost things. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to walk through those parables, starting off with probably the most famous of them all, the parable of the lost sheep. Um, oh, not yet. Uh, so <laughs> too soon. Uh, the, well, the, the parable, like, even if you don't think you know it, you know it. Um, uh, it's songs like Amazing Grace. You guys know that one? I once was lost, but now I'm found. That's, that terminology, that language comes from the parable of the lost sheep uh, and the, some of the others. Uh, there's actually popular song out. It's probably not new. It's uh, probably five, six, seven years old. Uh, but Reckless Love, if you guys know the, 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 let me give you a one line of it just to kind of say it directly comes from this parable. It says, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And that is a direct reference to this parable of the lost sheep, which is the one lost sheep and the 99 that are still in the flock. Now you can do the slides. It shows up in artworks a lot. Um, I didn't get the best kids picture, but as you can see, like kids Bible will always have a picture like this of a really cute little cuddly lamb um, being held or carried by a shepherd. Um, but there's lots. I mean, actually the lost sheep has been the product of a lot of artwork. And so uh, some people, then they show me the next one. Um, some people have it like this. You've probably seen something like this and where 
Uh, that is just the sweetest looking lamb you've ever seen. Uh, and there's this, this kind of connotation that it's just a sweet little innocent lamb uh, that has been lost and we should, you know, be, be, be searching for it. Uh, I, I do wonder if the shepherd thought of the lost sheep like this or if he was like, you no good, darn, you know, kind of a, you never know, um, which l- l- leads to the next one. There's this idea of like, oh, this is the exhausted. This is the, the, the shepherd who, I, mean, I like this one because I feel like this is more reality. He's been searching for the sheep and he is tired. He finally found it. So he's holding on to it, but he's exhausted. Uh, and that to me is kind of a little bit, uh, I feel more than the other one. You know, uh, there, there might be the idea of like putting it in a chokehold or something to keep it from getting out. Uh, I like this next one too. This is what I call the action hero shepherd. Uh, for some odd reason, I'm not quite sure why the lost sheep, if you can see it, it's at the very bottom. It's like somehow found itself like dangling from an edge of a cliff. And you've got the shepherd who, who is like doing one of those Tom Cruise Mission Impossible moves. And he's going to rescue the sheep, that, you know, the action. And then you've got the eagle that's just kind of like, ha ha, you know, <laughs> laughing at that. Not an eagle, but whatever it is. Uh, so looks like a seagull, but that's just the wrong place for a seagull. <laughs> Uh, so, all right. Uh, and then you've got these, uh, and, and I wondered about this one. This is like the not so lost sheep, uh, and it's like it, it's it's just over there. Um, and, and you wonder, you know, is it just having an emotional moment? It needs a a break. I, I wouldn't consider that as lost as uh, that. You know, the parable would describe. Uh, this one actually went viral in the last few this few months. Um, I don't know if you've seen this one, but that's like I consider it like the action movie version. You almost you can feel the suspense, and it's this little baby mud covered, and that you know blurred out, but in the background running towards the sheep is Jesus. You know, uh, I like that. One. I think it's cool. But you need the music. You need the dun 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 dun. You know, kind of like music in the background because that's where they're going. But but all these interpretations of this parable are a good example of what parables are about. Um, parables are stories, stories, and they don't, you know, they're not meant to be, um, you know, obviously, you know, people are people and sheep are sheep. Uh, there's not a direct parallel. Uh, they teach lessons and they give a message, but they're open for a little bit of artistic interpretation. Um, so, and so that's why you get, you know, the, the shepherd and sometimes it's the baby sheep and sometimes it's an adult sheep and sometimes, you know, because uh, the parable doesn't tell us. So, so today we're going to walk through this parable and we're going to read it together and then you can kind of determine for yourself what you think it means. And so uh, if you open your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 15, uh, 1 through 7 for the entirety of this message. And so uh, here, let me read it with you. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing, And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So let me just, a couple things to notice right away. I hope you kind of, uh, when you, the reason he tells the parable is because he is hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. That's kind of what the passage tells us. And people are objecting to that. And so he tells them this parable about the lost sheep. And so what you have to see right away is that the lost sheep is equal to the sinners and tax collectors, okay? And so there's that connection. Um, That may not seem like a big deal, but it is. The, the big deal was is that a lot of times 
if we are in a context of, I don't know what you would say, but let's say the church or those outside the church, uh, and I don't know what you, whoever, just have someone in mind that you, you're not really a big fan of, uh, you might want to say, oh, I'm not, I'm not like them. I'm, I'm, they're, they're, you know, they are, they're, they're, they're different. They're not like us. Uh, this passage is saying, oh, no, no, you're sheep, all of you. And that one that's lost belongs with the, with the 100, with the 99. Uh, so don't be sitting there saying us and them, it's us. It's, and it's a fairly, you know, like I said, not a, doesn't seem like, but the Pharisees and the religious leaders did not see sinners and tax collectors as like them. And so in this passage, he's saying that sheep is, the lost one is the sinners and the tax collectors, and the found ones are you religious people. But guess what? You belong together. You're supposed to be in the same flock. That was a pretty profound point. Uh, the other part is, this one's interesting, notice that what it means to be lost. Um, you know, if, if you guys know anything about shepherds, and uh, I'm not assuming today we don't really do this as much, maybe if you're from New Zealand, you would. Uh, but uh, but apart from that, what used to be is shepherds would basically go get lost with their sheep. They would take their herd, and they would leave wherever their home was, and out they go into the countryside, sleeping in the elements, you know, kind of just going from hillside to hillside or grassy area to grassy area uh, while they fed their flock. Uh, and so it wasn't like their home, okay? So shepherds... The, by definition, don't, they don't stay home. Those are ranchers and cattlemen or whatever you want to call it. But that's, uh, and so it's not being home that makes you lost or found. Uh, and it's also, interestingly, it's not whether you're with the shepherd or not. Uh, because uh, when the shepherd goes and looks for the lost sheep, it's not like the 99 now are lost. Okay. Interesting, what it means to be lost is that you're not with, with the community you're supposed to be with. You're not with your people. You're not with your, the, the people that you are meant to be with. You're, not, you're on your own. You're isolated. And so separation is what it means to be lost. Um, and so, it's, it's, so there's this sense that that sheep that's off by itself will remain lost until it's reunited with the herd, with the flock. That's what makes something found versus lost. Okay. The other thing that's kind of interesting, it's not quite you know, clear whether the sheep itself knew it was lost. All right? We can assume that it did, you know, but you know, like some of the artwork shows it kind of scared and trembling uh, as the shepherd comes and in other parts, you, you, you don't know. Uh, maybe the sheep thought it like, you know what, I'm done with the herd. I want to go venture off on my own. You know, I'm going to go be my own sheep. And uh, or maybe he didn't think it was a sheep anymore. Maybe he thought, you know, I'm not a sheep, I'm a lion. You know, and uh, I'm going to go, you know, live my life as whatever I want to be. Uh, kind of what we're dealing with a lot with today. People say, I want to be whatever I want to be. I'm not what I am. I, I can be whatever I want to be, but I wanted you to, see, you know, yeah, I, I can't help but think of Dave Hines on this. Sorry, Dave, I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but I'm, you know, Dave goes hiking, like long, long hikes, uh, continental divide type hikes, and so he's by himself on these trails, uh, and I, you know, if a sheep ever crosses path, I'm not, I promise you, Dave is not, he's not going to be like, <gasps> you know, like, you know, and cower in fear of this mighty, terrifying sheep that thinks it's a lion. Or that thinks it's some sort of, you know, but if an actual mountain lion were to kind of come your way, that'd be a little bit more of a challenge. But the reality is, is that it, it, the sheep, even if it thinks it's something else, is still a sheep. And everyone else in the world knows it's a sheep. And no matter what it thinks it might be, it is not going to change who it is. And so maybe it thought it would, it would rather run with the wolves, you know what I mean? And and I, I, I hate that you sheep are so boring. Uh, I want to go hang out with the cool wolves out there. Uh, I promise you, if a sheep goes and hangs out with wolves, 
It is not going to be buddies with the wolves. You know, it'll be the wolves next meal. The hard reality is the sheep is a sheep no matter what it thinks it could be or should be. Um, and so that kind of brings up to the idea that being lost has two different scenarios about it. One is that physically you aren't where you're supposed to be. You're not found. But also predicament-wise. Um, you're in a situation where you're a little helpless. And I don't know if you guys, if you ever, you just look at any kind of like one of those uh, predators, what do they look for? You know, predators look for the one that is separate from the herd. Uh, they look for the easy target. And that sheep being separate from the herd just puts a big bullseye on it saying, easy target. And, and so not only is it lost from being not with the herd, it's lost because it is in a dangerous situation. I would say, it's an issue. I'm going to show you a funny picture. This, I would say there's one sheep that figured out how to stop the predators from getting it, and it's a sheep they now call Shrek. Um, and I'm going to show you a picture of this sheep, uh, if I can. Oh, did I not put it up there? I didn't put it up there. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I'll have to paint the picture, okay? You may have seen this picture. It was a sheep that had been lost for six years. It's in a New Zealand sheep, and they found it. Uh, that also means it hadn't been sheared for 16 years. And so if you can imagine like a cloud, uh, a, a walking cloud on the ground uh, with like tiny nostril holes that you could barely get out. You couldn't even see the feet. The sheep was so overgrown. Uh, I'll put it on the Facebook family page so you guys can see it later. It was a genius. But the point was, it was an isolated sheep. It was lost for six years. The only way it didn't get eaten is I don't think anything could eat it. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anything could gnaw through the wool to actually get to this sheep that had, you know. But now we don't have that ability. You know, we don't have the ability to grow this kind of protective layer around us. But, but here's the other thing that I want you to notice about this passage. Um, it's not about the sheep. It's about the shepherd. I know we call it the parable of the lost sheep. But the questions in the parable are not about the sheep. You know, they're not saying, why did you get so lost? What were you thinking? You know, it's about the parable, and it basically says to, to, the, to the people listening, it's like, which of you, um, over here, I'm sorry, here we go. It's so which man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lost the one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. You know, the question is directly to the shepherds. And so, so right, I'm going to take a poll. All right. So how many of you, and let's just use it. Let's say you're all, you know, junior shepherds, okay? And you've been given 100 sheep to take care of, and you've got to get them from point A to point B. All right? And so you're, you're going along, and you're halfway from point A to point B, and you realize you're down a sheep. One's missing. How many of you keep going and say, what, 99 out of 100 is good enough? Anyone? A few? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. I'll take it. You know, one, one out of 99, it's, that's all right. How many of you say, nope, nope, I'm going to leave the 99 by themselves while I go search for the one that I lost? All right, all right. Yeah, thank you for being honest, all right? Uh, now, that's kind of where we get the song, the reckless love song that I was talking about. Uh, because in some people's perception, leaving 99 sheep in order to look for one doesn't make sense, okay? And so that's why people say, oh, the overwhelming, reckless love of God. Uh, but, you know... But I want you to see something. In this parable, the assumption of the parable is you go. You know, the assumption is that as he's reading it, that he's not expecting the answer. To, no one's going to sit there and say, uh, no, I don't go. It's like that double negative. Which of you wouldn't leave the 99. This, it, the idea is, you, of course you would. 
And, and I think that's because we are kind of separate from the shepherding world where, you know, you're responsible for all of those and every one of those, you've you got to account for everyone. I, I think about, the, you know, Carol, I don't know if she can hear me, um, but Carol, our children's director, we, we've been doing safety training uh, as a, and we're going to, some of you are volunteers, we're going to be going through some safety training. But there's this mentality uh, by professionals that if, 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 if you have one kid who's like, you know, trapped uh, under a wall uh, and while, during an earthquake, and uh, the idea is leave the kid and rescue the others. Now, I have to tell you that, that that's not going to happen with Carol. Carol will lift the wall and she will rescue every single one of those kids. So, you know, she, she, I, I think there, there's a lot of us who sit there and go, I couldn't do it. I couldn't just leave one. Of course, I would try to make sure the most of them were safe, but, but you know, there, and I think that's a shepherd mentality, is that you sit there and you say, this is not about odds. This is not about grade. This is about something precious to you. You can't just leave it. And so I think shepherds are, are you know, their expectation was 100%. They, 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 you know, and there's other passages that talk about, you know, who doesn't lay down their life. If wolves are attacking your flock, you get them. But, you know, it's, like I said, they weren't just commodities. They were things that they held to be dear to them. I would equate it to, uh, like, you know, airline pilots. How many of you are going to go on a flight with an airline pilot that says, well, you know, 99 out of 100 times I land? <laughs> yeah, uh, but one out of 100, eh, you know, pretty good, though. I, that's a 99 percentile. No, I kind of want perfection when it comes to certain occupations. And so, so shepherding was one of those where people expected that shepherds, you don't lose a sheep. You do whatever you can because, and it's the idea, if you, if you give up one, then what's one more? And then what's one more? And when, when does it become, you know, 50-50? You know, and I, 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 49 I lost, but 51, the idea was is you kept the standard high so that you, you didn't get into the habit of losing sheep. So the challenge is, is that I wish it was just that easy. I wish it was just as easy just as to say, you know, okay, uh, uh, go, go find it. You know, like the idea that the sheep is just over the bin. It's a little bit of a nuisance, but leave the 99, go get them, come back. It's like, you know, when you leave your phone at home and you're like, oh, you know, turn around, go home, go back, get your phone. You know, it's, it's not just another trip. I mean, I, I wish it was that easy. But the reality is, is that sometimes sheep don't want to be found. And the reality in our world is some sheep really want to remain lost. They may not say it that way, but that's the world we're living in today. Where it seems like even more so today, people visually are shouting to the church, leave me alone, go away. I don't want you. I don't want to be found by you. Um... I think about, I, 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 you know, I didn't want to put up pictures, honestly, because I didn't want to, you know, dishonor any person. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about when you, you know, when you, when you see images of things like a pride parade, of where people are dressed in hyper-sexualized ways or, uh, you know, ways that are just uncomfortable and it's that way of basically any of you who think of, of sex as the way the church has taught it, I'm just going to throw the opposite in your face. And so make you uncomfortable. I don't want your, what you're teaching. I think about, you know, um, you know, and you probably have seen this, you know, people, young men who, who dress in, a, in such a way that they just, they want to be known as tough, mean, maybe a killer, you know, maybe they'll get tattoos on their face. And the idea is, I'm dangerous. I'm a, I'm a wolf. You don't want to be around me. Uh, I'm a threat. I, you know, I'm not like you guys. 
you know, there's those, you know, I remember, I don't know what you call it today, but in my day, it was called like, like goth or emo, but it was like this idea that I'm going to be so fascinated with the occult and the dark and the uh, satanic, and, uh, and I'm just going to dress in a way that clearly says that I am anti-Christian. I see people who, who you know, have, you know, tattoo themselves get plastic surgery to the point of trying to just be as shocking to everyone else around them as possible so that they, you know, are sending this message that leave me alone. I don't want to be found by you, church. That's why I thought it would be interesting that, that you know, it's, what you see in this parable uh, is that you see a little bit of that. The sheep, when he, he doesn't just hear the shepherd's voice and come running. Did you notice that? If you look at it, he says, you know, um, and when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders uh, rejoicing. There's this just reality that uh, a sheep doesn't just come back when you call it. Um, it whoever knows, whatever reason it might be, that the shepherd literally had to put the sheep on his shoulders and carry that sheep back to the herd. Uh, it was not going to come willingly. Uh, you can talk about maybe why you think that might be in your life groups this week, but... Uh, one of the things I would say is that, you know, there's this sense that, and I, this is, I think, where, you know, Nick and Hannah talked about who we are as a church at the beginning, saying that we are, exist to be a loving community and to extend that community to our neighbors and those who need it. I think it demonstrates the power of that community. Because um, like I said, the parable basically says we're all sheep. And guess what? All sheep are looking for a herd. Uh, everyone, and, and we too, as human beings, as much as we don't like to say it, we're not as independent as we want to claim to be. We want community. We want to be welcome and to feel like we belong. And so what you'll see is that people, uh, even when they're lost, will find other lost people and say, hey, we found each other, we're home. And they'll, they'll have that power of community. And uh, there's a lot of books and stories out there. Uh, you can hear of people who one of the biggest challenges to them to being open to hearing where they really belonged, who they really were in Christ, who God made them to be, one of the biggest challenges to that is it threatened their relationship with the community they had found. That they had identified with being something out of the church or not in the church. And even though they were still looking for other things, they struggled to leave that in order to go to the other ones. But one of the things that would help them make that bridge when they did is the church provided the community they were, they were really looking for. I saw this all the time when I was in Austin where people uh, would uh, identify by some sort of hobby. You know, it, it, cycling was the one I knew. People would go on these bike rides and mass, like 500 people. It was kind of fun, cool. Um, but that was their group. And if you stopped riding your bike, you lost your group. Uh, it centered around pinball, crazy enough. There were like pinball arcades where people, that was, those were their people. Um, and you can go down the list, but people were identifying by some sort of, this is, they found their people, but you knew it fell apart because the minute you stop doing whatever that thing was, you were out. Until you find your true herd, which is the church where, you know, you, you're never out. Uh, you may walk away, but the church never is going to stop. So, 
Community is a very powerful tool when it comes to... The idea was is that the shepherd would get the sheep, put them on his shoulders, bring them back to the herd, and then the sheep would be like, oh, oh this is where I belong. It's the herd that made the sheep feel found. Um, so here, the next one is this. The idea that uh, the next question of the parable uh, is given to the, to, the, to the shepherd is that he says, who of you doesn't leave your, the 99? But it's in, once again, it follows up with the second question. And, and I wish it would leave, do it as a question mark. And it says, because and, this is verse 6, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice for, with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. You know, so that's the second part of the question. It's like, who of you wouldn't leave to find the one? And when you find the one, who wouldn't bring his friends and neighbors together to have this party and rejoice? Um, once again, this, the, the assumption is, is that this would be a universally accepted. We all would. Um, and I, you know, the idea that uh, if I found my sheep that was lost and I brought it home and I invited you to my house to celebrate that I found my lost sheep, you would come and you would celebrate with me. That's kind of the assumption in the question. And I'm going to say, guys, this is where we as a church have to ask ourselves, would we? Would we celebrate someone bringing someone in who used to be out? That is a question that divides the church today. I hope today here it's 100%, but I know it isn't in every church we talk about. Um, some, honestly, still have the mentality of being reaching out and winning the loss, finding them, bringing them in. But some people within the church, and I've had the idea of, like, build a wall. You know what? They, let's keep them out. Let's disassociate Let's just forget about them. They're lost. And so and they would have a point of like a lost cause. Even. Um, even to the point where I've heard, you know, a word that I like that uh, uh, has come under fire, and it's the word winsome. You know, and the idea of, you know, as Christians, we ought to be winsome, gentle, kind, respectful of people we disagree with. Uh, that word has come under fire a lot. Now the idea is that we shouldn't be winsome. We should be, uh, you know, uh, combative. Uh, that we should be fighting. Uh, and this is where Jesus leaves the metaphor, leaves the parable, because he, I don't know what he's thinking. Maybe they're divided on whether they should be celebrating this found sheep that was lost and uh, and so he just leaves the parable and he just makes it abundantly clear. And he says, just so, you know, just in case you're wondering, I'll tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents and over the 99 persons, uh, righteous persons who need no repentance. Just to be clear, if you're wondering if God is you know cares about whether you find that one or not i'm just going to tell you in heaven where it really matters we celebrate that person we rejoice over that more so than than having kept the 99 uh, i think that's just like whew. if you're waffling in your head wondering whether the lost sheep is worth it you know, that was basically saying, God saying, worth it. I'm just going to answer for you. Yeah, you know, so I'm not going to leave you guessing. Um, I get that some people think that it would be better off to just abandon the mission of Christ in our world and just kind of hunker down and protect our own. You know, let's make sure we don't lose another. Of course, that changes when one of those lost sheep is someone you care about. And then it stops being kind of like a, a game of odds. And now you realize, oh no, this is a game of life and death. 
And I am not going to let go of one, even one, if I have anything I can do about it. Um, so, I, you know, some of the people know in the church, uh, I lost my father yesterday morning. Uh, uh, I was going to say maybe I didn't know when to say it, but this is the right time. Uh, yeah, uh, he'd been declining for a long time, um, mid-80s, uh, been losing his memory. I don't know if I shared with you, uh, because of his memory loss, we were reconciled in, a, in the best way we can because he forgot why he was mad at me. But I had lost my father when I was 20 relationally because I had come to Christ and he would have no part of that. And so I bring that up, uh, and I hope I'll keep it together. Um, I bring it up because uh, over the years, I would always reach out, reach out, reach out, try to reconcile that relationship. And then it was a gift when he forgot. And we had phone calls, and we could talk face to face. And we actually visited with him a few months uh, in the spring. Um, and uh, But I think about it because... The hard reality is that even though this parable describes of of the shepherd who finds his sheep and rejoices when he comes home, the hard reality is we don't find every sheep we're looking for. And sometimes there are sheep that stay lost, um, that get, you know, the predators get to them before the shepherd does. Um, And I bring it up because the thing that got me yesterday was, you know, you wonder, did I look hard enough? And I'm just going to tell you, because I know people will sit there, you did such a, you know, you you tried. It never feels, when you lose a sheep, it never feels like you tried hard enough as a shepherd. I don't think you, anyone will ever sit there and go, you know, well, did my best, too bad. The only thing that brings peace to the shepherd is finding the stinking sheep, putting it on his shoulders, and taking it home. And I'm going to say, guys, that is the heart of a shepherd. You don't give up until you find it, because you will not have peace yourself until you find that sheep. Matthew also describes this parable, or gives this parable in in a different account, but it adds what I think is just a beautiful um, little addition. It's actually shorter than the one in Luke, but let me read it to you. Because what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. There are some crazy things going on in our world today people that are just antagonistic and hostile towards the church. But they're lost sheep. And hear it when it says, it's not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish, nor should it be ours. Let's pray. Lord Father, thank you so much for this parable this day. I know I needed it. Um, And Lord, I just pray that we would do our very best to pursue and seek uh, the lost. Uh, I know they're precious to you. Uh, And whether we admit it or not, they are precious to us. Help us, Lord, to be Uh, a church that leaves the 99 because the one is worth it. 
Help us to be a place, Lord, where people who are that lost sheep feel like there is a shepherd who knows where they ought to be and who loves them. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand? Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate this place. Uh, appreciate every person in this place. And it is my prayer uh, that everyone that we know that's a lost sheep out there would know there's someone pursuing them, uh, who's seeking after them. And they would never wonder if there's not an open door at the church for them if they ever choose to be found again. Uh, so just to let you guys know, hang out a little bit afterwards. We'd love to just fellowship as a church. You've got 17 minutes exactly um, uh, until the next class starts. We're also doing a class over here. Last days, young adults will be over in the gallery. Youth and children's will be on too. So hang around and enjoy a little bit of that. So, uh, But before you go, please receive God's blessing through his benediction. May the Lord who is the good father and good shepherd who pursued you, gave his life for you so that you may know what it is to be loved and you may know what it is to be found. May his strength and power be with you. May it be in you this week as you look at people. May you see those lost sheep that the shepherd is looking for. And may your heart turn towards them and may you help them find their way home. To him be glory, honor, and praise both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Thank you.